we left off last time, we were talking about the actual tree, the Eitz Hadas, the tree of knowledge. And we were discussing why it doesn't mention in the beginning what tree they use to sin, and it only mentions it at the end. Rashi says, oh, it was the same tree that they were sowing their clothes to rectify the sin. Oh, that was really the type of tree that they sinned with. So we said that Hashem does not want the tree to be shamed. And we learned this tremendous lesson of we don't embarrass somebody. And even if it makes sense to say this was a tree and it would, you know, it would be nice. We would have the knowledge. We would know what tree it was. And we can, but he doesn't want us to feel like we have to stay away from that tree. And, oh, that tree is now shamed forever. Because when you say something, even if afterwards you say, oh, but they fixed it up. They, the first impression still remains very strong. And when you embarrass someone, even if you come back, it's very hard to rectify. So, for example, there's, you know, a muscle, there is a parable that's given. You have a pillow full of feathers and you let out the feathers, you don't know where they went to afterwards. So when you want to come back and say, oh, but I'll just gather all the feathers and I'll put them back in, you can't always do that. Sometimes the feathers went further away. So when you embarrass somebody, you can't always make it up. You don't know who else found about it. You can't go to every single person and go collect and, you know, come back and rectify. And the pain that was there, it's already, you know, too late. That was one thing um, towards the end of the class that we discussed. We also were discussing this idea of, you know, not reminding somebody of something that they've done in the past. And we said, for example, if there is a convert, you don't say to them, oh, remember you used to sin and do this and this, or let's say somebody, you know, wasn't always as religious as they are now, or maybe whatever it may be, you know, maybe this person did things in the past that they're ashamed of and they're embarrassed of, you know, maybe they weren't a good person and they were a thief and now they decided to be a good person. So we don't remind them of what they use, of what they used to do. And then we were discussing towards the very end of the class um, about this idea of now Adam and Chava had this knowledge of bad and they can use their bodies for something other than a mitzvah. And in the beginning it said, they were not embarrassed. They were naked. They were not embarrassed because I can only use my body for serving Hashem. So what's to be embarrassed of? But then it says over here, it says they recognized and they realized, oh, I'm unclothed. And they were embarrassed because now they have this knowledge of evil and I could use my body for evil and I could misuse it. And so that's where we left off. We were talking about this need for modesty. And we said that once they sinned and they realized, you know, if you're only using things for holiness, then, you know, you're holy and there's nothing to discuss. You don't need to worry about anything. But if you have the choice to use something either for good and bad, you can't just rely, I'm going to use it for good. And that was the first thing that happened. Chava thought, I'm just going to have good and bad and don't worry, I'm just going to use it for good. But then she realized as soon as she ate from it, as soon as we know we could use it for sin, well, we're human. And we have a heart and we have emotions and we have temptations. And then, well, maybe I am going to use it for the wrong thing. And so what do we need to do? We can't just resolve and say, I'm going to use it for the right thing. We have to protect ourselves. And that's what clothing is. Clothing has two functions. Clothing is used to express and to protect. So clothing, on the one hand, protects me. If it's cold outside and I have clothing to keep me warm, 
if it's hot outside, a clothing could protect me from the sun. It also could protect me just from being vulnerable and being treated as an object. If I'm going to go out there not properly dressed and not modestly dressed, I'm sending out a message to people. I'm available. I'm cheap. You can come get me. Uh, you can start up with me. But if I dress myself modestly, I show that I'm not available. I'm very, you can't just, I'm not so cheap. I'm more, you know, if you see someone dressed, in very expensive, beautiful clothing. Let's just say she went to Neiman Marcus and she picked out a gorgeous outfit and she's dressed very modestly and a stranger sees her. That's scenario number one. And then scenario number two is someone who's, you know, wearing a tank top and not, you know, more cheap looking and not so covered up and not so, you know, modest. And they are sending off a message of I'm more available, you know, like I'm easy to come to. I'm, I already exposed my body, like, you know, here, if you want to come. So the person who's dressed more regally, more modestly, it's more likely that someone's not going to just start up, but they're going to think like, oh, she's too regal. She's too you know, she must be taken, she must be, you know, have someone that she's with. And, you know, I can't just like, as a random person on the street, come to her. So the clothing expresses who we are, and what we're doing. When I go to a wedding, I'm dressed very fancy, I'm expressing that in a fancy place, I want to be like this. When I'm going to the beach, I'm dressed in a different way. Wherever, so it expresses where I am, I'm coming to a fan, you know, a very important meeting. If I come not dressed properly, I'm not giving the proper respect. They're not going to take me as serious. And if I come dressed up like I'm going to a wedding, when I'm going to play sports, no one's going to take me serious either because it's not the right attire for the situation. So, and we know when we see people, you can sort of see their personality through their dress. It expresses who you are and, you know, different people dress differently across the board. And then the same person will dress differently also based on where they are, what they want to express at that moment. I want to, I'm in a sporty mood. I want to be express myself like that. I'm in a lazy mood. I want to express myself like that. Um, I see your hand, Amy. I'm going to take it in a minute. So that's, you know, expressing yourself. And then there's protecting, like you said, protecting from the sun, protecting, and also just protecting from me being vulnerable. If I'm wearing a certain outfit, I am protecting myself much more that no one is going to just come to me and, you know, take advantage of me. Yes, Amy, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. So I, I agree with everything you're saying. Now, I, I have one question on what you said and just something from another lesson. So um, this, this signaling with the dressing, I agree 100%. Um, my question is, sometimes you try to explain modesty to other people. And um, the first thing that they'll throw out is oh yes but you have those women with the hijabs and you know and their men are still bothering them so i'd like a, a response to that um, right so it can. does not mean that if you dress perfectly modest that you are you know free from being mistreated not at all but there are certain levels of protection i'm not going to go with my diamond necklace and my diamond ring and all this to Hialeah, you know, or whatever, you know, a place that I feel is, I'm not going to go and put myself in a situation, you know, where it's going to be. Um, you know, we live in our society, our religion. I can't really answer, you know, for other people's um, religions. In the Taira, there is a lot, a lot of emphasis put on respecting the woman. And that is very big. And that is very important for us. And if you look at the Ksuba, the marriage contract, it's all about what the man has to provide for the woman. Because that's his obligation. So that's the way we set it up. In other 
you know, like you said, they're going with their, you know, fully covered and, you know, and they're still being attacked. I don't know what their respect level is and what it is, and I can't worry about them, but in, in Judaism, there's a lot of emphasis on the man respecting the woman and giving a tremendous amount of respect. So if things aren't set up right and they don't have respect for the other person to start, then you know, even if they're covering up, they're not treated to respect them, and there's not much you could do about that. You know, they're not training them in that way. So we have a system where men are demanded to respect the woman, but nonetheless, they have their desires. So we have to make sure that we set it up properly so that that doesn't get in the way. So that's, you know, that's the way that we have to go about it. But if they don't have that foundation of respect in the first place, and we also want to protect ourselves from other people, not in our religion, that's what I said. Even if you're wearing something beautiful and you would say, well, wouldn't he want to go to the more gorgeous woman who has her makeup done beautifully and she's wearing a gorgeous dress? But no, if you look at statistics, they're not going to go to that woman because she's putting up a certain boundary of, I'm too, I'm too up there, you know? So, so that's the idea that, you know, if it's set up originally with the strong foundation, if it's not. And, and to add to that, before I take Natalie's question, that we consider modesty as privacy. Like I, we started to discuss a little bit last class, class ended, when you have a tyra, the more holy something is, the more you cover it and protect it. The tyra has to have a, a mezuzah, has to have a covering. We don't just throw it out there. It, it needs to have that it's private. This is so holy that it's only for certain people, for certain places. It's not just, you know, when something's cheap, it's everywhere. Anyone can get it. What makes something expensive? It's not available to everybody. It's only available for certain times and for certain people and for certain places. So since our body is so, so holy, we said the higher something is, the lower it falls. Because our body is so holy, it could be misused. And unfortunately, in today's society, we see the body as something very mundane and something very coarse. And that's if it's being misused and it's not in the proper way, then yes, that is true, that it, that it is. But that's only because it has potential to be used so high that this is our body is something that can be used to create a child, to nurture a child. This is the, the way we are closest to, most similar to God. Usually when a person creates, whatever it is that you wanna create, let's say someone created, well, you can't see because of it. Okay, someone created this pencil. They didn't really, they just took flat. They're just re, reshaping certain things. They didn't actually create this from scratch. Um, you know, you have a desk, you just took wood and reformed it. You didn't actually make it from scratch. God creates from scratch. The closest thing we have to that is childbirth, which the woman does. And as a matter of fact, what, we're, what the Torah tells us to cover is our collarbone, our elbow, our knees. And when we start being more lax with things such as the collarbone and the elbow, that, will, that can lead, doesn't mean it will, but when you start being lenient with your collarbone, then that leads to seeing one's breasts and same with the, the sleeve. It doesn't mean that if it's a little bit above, you're going to see into that area. But if you're being lax, you know, with that, with that area, that could lead to, you know, seeing into the breast area, which is our nurturing. This is what a gift that's only given to a woman that we're able to nurture a baby and keep a baby alive. And so that's very holy and that's very important and that's something unique to women. And, it, and when, we, when people are more lax and covering their knees and wear very short skirts, that could lead to seeing to a woman's private area, which is how we create a child. So these are showing that these are very holy things and therefore we have this extra protection. In addition, um, we, we, what do we show? 
which maybe will also shed some light on Amy's question, that we do show our face and our hands where, you know, the Torah tells us to be covering our body, but our hands and our face, it says, no, 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 that show, show that, that should be open. We don't wear and cover like other religions do. And that is because that is symbolic. Our face is symbolic. When you look at someone, you look into their eyes and you see their eyes and you read their lips and you get their that's why texting nowadays is such a problem sometimes because you don't really know what the person's you can't see their facial expressions you don't really know what they're feeling so a person's face shows number one their feelings and their emotion number two it shows their brain what they're thinking what they stand for when you have a conversation with somebody you see their what oh wow look she's so smart oh look how she feels Okay, and your hands are symbolic of your actions, what you do, what you form, what you make. And that's what we say. We don't want to be judged only for my body and taken advantage of that someone just wants me for my body. Yes, my body is very beautiful, and Hashem specifically made the woman's body very beautiful, but not up for anybody. That's only for someone that I choose to, you know, this is for my husband. This is for someone you know, close to me. This is not just for anybody. But what do we show? What do we want people when people are out in the world? What's their biggest complaint? They're treating me as an object. Why is the woman being mistreated? So we say, what are we showing? We want someone to acknowledge. I want someone to acknowledge me for my face, for my intellect and my emotions, my thoughts. When, and for my hands, for my actions, that's where I want to, I don't want to be just liked for, you know, and then people get into things, they like them for their body, and they don't really care about what they think and what they say and what they do and what they stand for. And then, you know, they're in trouble. But if you first meet someone for what you stand for and what you think, and then if you want to let them in, if it's, you know, I want to marry this person, I want them to be my husband, then, you know, that's, I can let them further into my private area. Um, so, Amy, I hope that answered your question. Um, and Natalie, you had a question. Uh, yes. At the beginning, it was just Adam and Chava. There wasn't anyone else around. When did clothing become important? When did well, we they, have they did other it. people? Yes, they did give birth. Um, they did give birth right away before they sinned with the tree of knowledge. They, they, they did already have children. So we discussed last class that they had children in the eighth hour. Okay, so they already had children. Um, they were commanded in the 10th hour. So there were people around, there were their children. And as you see, these animals, like the, the snake, was he desired Adam and he desired Chava. And that's why he started up with this whole thing. He wanted Chava. So there were, they also were around. And, and, and so as long as anyone else is around, and as a matter of fact, it tells us one of the first things that it discusses in our code of Jewish law, which is called the Shulchan Arach, it says that a person should shavisi Hashem meneg v'samen, which means I shall place God always before me so we even want to be modest even like in my house even where you know i don't have i don't there's a certain sense of modesty that god is always around and hashem sees everything we're doing and we want to be modest obviously not to the same level you know if i'm amongst just women let's say i'm going swimming and it's just with women then that's appropriate i could be you know in my swimsuit and i could be more exposed and that's okay so there's a time and place you know, in Judaism, it's really all about the time and the place and the people, etc. For example, that's what I'm explaining. Intimate relations is the most holy. It's compared to the holy of holies in the holy temple. It is the most holy if it is done with the right person at the right time. If the woman went to mikvah 
then yes, if she went to mikvah and she followed all the laws and she was having relations with her husband at the right time, because when a woman, a woman gets her period, when she menstruates during that time, she's not allowed to be with her husband. And then she has to count seven days after that and go to mikvah. And then once she goes to mikvah, now she is pure. Now it's a mitzvah to have relations with her husband. It's not just like, okay, this is a mitzvah. This is something positive. This is something holy that needs to be, that, that, that should be done. So then it's holy. So when, she, before she goes to mikvah, it's considered a tremendous sin. After she goes to mitzvah, it's a tremendous mitzvah. If it's with her husband at the right time, meaning after she went to mitzvah, it's a mitzvah. If it's with someone else's husband, it's a tremendous, tremendous sin. So you see the same thing depends when and where it's done. And a very simple example is eating. Eating on Shabbos is a mitzvah. Eating the day before Yom Kippur is a mitzvah. Eating on Yom Kippur is a sin. So it's all about when and where it's done. So in general, if the, the modesty became a thing right now, after they sinned, that's what we said, that now suddenly they realize, oh my goodness, I need to wear clothing. Because since then, we all are exposed to bad and we all have this free choice of good, bad. Hey, what do I choose? Do I use it for good or do I use it for bad? So since that time until forever, we, we need to wear the clothing, but we see that even within clothing, there's different time and places where, you know, when a woman goes into mikvah, she's not wearing any clothing. That's the mitzvah. That's, you know, an appropriate time. Obviously it's just her and the mikvah attendant taking her in. That's an appropriate place. You know, so it all depends. But in general, even in our own homes, we try to be more modest, you know, in general, you know, when you're just around your house. Um, and this idea of mikvah, if anybody is married, even if they didn't go to mikvah earlier while they were menstruating, but you can still go to mikvah and it's a very unique there's something very unique about this mitzvah that's not like other mitzvahs. And that is that it says that if a woman goes to mikvah, even later, after she finished menstruating and she's not having children anymore, it will work retroactively and bring tremendous, tremendous blessings to her children. So if there's anyone you know who missed the opportunity to go during their married life, sorry, during their younger years when they were menstruating, and they never went, they could still go as a one-time thing later on in life. And it brings tremendous, tremendous blessings. So if anyone is married, it's a beautiful, beautiful mitzvah, you know, to take on themselves, whether, you know, they're younger or they're older. Um, you know, of course, if they're older and they already went, you know, while they were menstruating, then they're pure and they, they don't need to go. But if someone hasn't, um, you know, but that's a separate class and discussion in itself. But if anyone has interest in this, please reach out to me privately. And I would, you know, love to share all that information. So now we're going to uh, move on to the next section, um, which is, I'm going to pull up the screen so we can see it. Um, okay. Okay. Does that, does everyone see it? Yes. Do you see just the slide or you see like a lot of background stuff also? And uh, the knowledge of tree knowledge. Okay. Okay. So you see it properly. Okay. Um, okay. So now we're going to move on to we finish this, we're going to move on over here. So we discussed till now, we discussed the snake convincing Chava, we discussed the effect of the sin, and now we are going on to the conversation with Hashem, which is Psukim Ches Kriya Gimel, verses eight to 13. 
Well, you know, we're seeing like the sidebar and the stuff That's on the I bottom. Asked. I said, are you seeing more stuff and just the thing? And okay, so let me let me see if I can redo this better. I don't know why it showed up if differently. You make it larger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I did um okay, you know what? I'll just do it this way. Sorry. Um, okay, I'm going to try I, the way I usually do it. I don't know why it's not. If you have a lot of windows open, that maybe wouldn't. No, 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 no. I was presenting it in a certain way that it was only showing that portion. Let me just get back. To okay, let me see if I could do it this way. Okay, there. I I I, I forgot to click one button that just says portion of the screen. That's and, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what what happened over there. Okay. Anyway, so we, That's we okay. So here we are. The conversation with Shem. So we have over here. We're going to read. I'm just putting on the spotlight. Okay, there we go. So we have Vayishmu is called Hashem. And they heard the voice of Hashem, Elohim, our God, Mishalech Bagan. It was, they heard the voice of Hashem going in the garden. Leruach Hayoim, which is to the direction of the sun, which was west. And what happens? Because they heard God coming, you know, you hear God coming, the man and his wife hid from before him, before Hashem. And where did they hide? Hashem before Hashem. Besoich eitz hagan, in the midst of the trees of the garden. Okay, in the English, it translated as trees. But it says eights, which could mean tree or trees. So he's saying they hid in the middle of the tree of the garden, which seems to imply that they are that middle tree, which we said is a tadas, which is the tree of knowledge. That's what it looks like they are hiding in. So what happens next? Vayikra Hashem Elohim Adam and Hashem, God calls to man. And he says to him, Ayeka. Hashem calls out to man. He says to him, where are you? Because they're hiding. Where are you? Vayimer, who's speaking now? Man. And he says, as kol chashamati, I heard your voice. Bagan in the garden. Vairaki eru And I was afraid because I am naked, so I hid. So he's, Hashem says, where are you? He says, well, I heard you and I was so scared, so I, I hid. Vayimar, and he said, "Me higid lachal, who told you? Ki erum ata, that you are naked. Before you didn't know you were naked. How suddenly now do you know you're naked? Hamin ha eitz asher tivi secha levilti achal mimenu achalta. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat?" Okay, Adam responds, Vayimer ha'adam. And man said, Ha'isha asher nasata imadi, the woman that you have given to me. He nasna limena eats ba'aycha. She gave me of the tree, so I ate. So he says, the woman who you gave to be with me, the who... Hashem, you, you're the one who gave this to me, right? She gave it to me. Well, you gave it to me, so I thought she was good. She gave this to me to eat. So I ate. 
Vayomer Hashem Elikim, and Hashem said, Laisha, to the woman, now he talks to Chava, because what happened? Adam shifted the blame. Hey, it wasn't me, it was Chava. So he goes on to Chava. And he says, Ma Zeis Asisa, what is this that you have done? What have you done? But Taimer and Isha and the woman said, Hanachash Ha Shiani Vaoicha. The snake, the serpent enticed me and I ate. So she says, Well, you know, who was it? The, the, the snake got me into this trouble. So now let's discuss what's going on here in these verses. So it says they hid in the tree and Rashi actually explains that it was the tree that they sinned with. And so we have this question. What questions do you have? Anyone have a question here? They go and hide. There's lots and lots of trees over here in this garden and they hide in this tree that the, the middle tree, which is the tree that they send it. Does anyone have a question? Why did they pick that tree? Why did they pick that tree? Is didn't it Hashem know he, they were hiding? I'm sorry? Yeah. Didn't Hashem know that they were hiding? Yeah, sure. that's another great question. Excellent. Spot on on your two questions. So let's address the first question first. They, because that, that comes up first, those words, they hid in this tree that they sinned in. That's really strange. Why would you hide in the tree that you sinned in? You would think like, oh, I just sinned with that. Like run away from it. You want to kind of get far away from, and instead they're hiding in this tree. So why? What's going on? So Hashem's voice comes according to the holiness of the place. So because they were sinning in this, in this place, because they sinned, they decided, let's go. This is actually from the Alshech. And the Alshech explains that Hashem's voice comes according to the holiness of the place. If it's a very, very holy place, it's going to be with great refinement. It's going to be a very high level of Hashem. If it's an unholy place, then Hashem is going to come with a lot of thick coverings, a lot of symptom, a lot of contraction, and you're not going to see him in his full glory. So he's going to be more contracted. He's going to be more hidden. So they said, we don't want to go to a holy place where God is in his full glory, so holy. We just sin. We're on such a low level now. I will not be able to contain that high level of holiness. So if I stay in the middle of Gan Eden, in the holy place, not under this tree of sin, then it's going to be too holy. I'm on a low level now. I won't be able to handle it. So because I sin and I'm on this low level and I lessen my level of holiness, I won't be able to tolerate God's holy level. So I'm going to go to the place of sin where the holiness is less because that sin was just used, that tree was just used for sin. So now it's not so holy. And I will have a lesser level and I will be able to listen without fear because right now my vessel, my body is on a lower level. So imagine you have a glass that's very thin. You put boiling hot water in it, it's gonna crack. You need it to be a thicker vessel, a stronger vessel, because my vessel is really weak now. So if the water is very hot, if it's gone on such a holy level, I don't think I'm going to be able to handle it. So I'm going to now go to a lower place of holiness. So God's voice will be on a lower level and I'll be able to handle it. So that's what he did. Now let's go on to the second question that Sarah asked. And that was uh, in, in Pasuk Tess. Where God says, so they hide in this tree, fine. And God says, where are you? Ayaka. And he said, that's really strange. Because God knows. That's really, what is going on over here? Why 
is he saying, where are you? If he sees and he knows exactly where they are. So Rashi, the simple explanation says, it's to open the conversation. It's a rhetorical question. It's not serious. When you say to somebody, where, where are you? You know, he's not literally saying, I don't know where you are, but it's like, that's how he's starting off the conversation. So that's a simple meaning of Rashi. The deeper meaning that Hasidus brings, there's a very famous story of the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe. And the Alter Rebbe, he was imprisoned for spreading Judaism all over. And, you know, he was living in communist Russia and they didn't let you teach Torah and they didn't let you, you know, keep mitzvahs. And so because he was teaching Torah to people and because he was, you know, promoting Judaism, you know, so not to think that God forbid he, you know, did a crime, but because he was sending money to Israel and people misconstrued that and they said that he was, you know, going on the side of, Turkey, whatever, you know, all these different complicated things, but they basically, in other words, just to make clear that he was not in prison for doing any crimes other than giving charity and spreading and teaching Torah, you know, to Jewish people in mitzvahs. But anyway, so when he was in prison, the officer, who was a Jewish officer, but part of the Communist Party, came to investigate, and he happened to be very knowledgeable in Torah. He happened to be very knowledgeable. And he asked the Alter Rebbe, he says, you know, I have a question for you. This question that we just asked, he was very smart. He was very knowledgeable. And he said, let me take advantage. I have a great rabbi here who was more knowledgeable than myself. Let me ask him. So the officer asked him and he says to him, why did Hashem say, Ayeka, where are you? To Adam, it's obviously he knew where he is. And the Alter Rebbe responded to him and he said, do you believe that the Torah is eternal? Do you believe that the Torah every, is for every time and place? And the officer said, yes. So he said, so all questions are everlasting and apply to every person in every generation. And so this word, Ayeka, that Hashem said, applies to us nowadays also. And Hashem calls out to Adam. Adam means person. Hashem calls out to every person, not just Adam, asking this question, Ayeka, where are you? And what does that mean, where are you? Not literally, where are you? Oh, you're sitting at your seat. I know you're sitting at your seat. Where are you holding where are you doesn't mean physically right now. Are you standing under a tree? Are you sitting in a chair? It means where are you holding? And Hashem always calls out to a person, Ayeka, where are you found in your world? Every person has a budgeted number of years to do good deeds to Hashem and to other people in this world. And so the Altar Abbas says to the man, he's saying this, you know, Hashem always calls out to a person, Ayaka, where are you? Where are you found in the world? And every person has this budget amount of years. He's telling this to this officer. And what have you done? And he says to him, for example, so God is asking you this question, officer. And he says, for example, you live so and so years. And he said the exact age of this officer. The officer is now taken aback. Like, how does he know how old I am? This is a very great rabbi, the Alter Rebbe. And he had divine intervention, Ruach Kaidesh, and he was able to know things that Hashem granted him to know. And so he knew how old this officer was. And he said, what did you do? Did you help somebody? And that's what he asked him. And so Hashem is constantly asking us. He asked Adam, that's what he was asking Adam. Where are you holding? What's going on? Not where are you physically? But Hashem is also always asking us constantly, because Adam is man, where are you holding? What are you doing? Take a moment and stop before you want to do tshuva. You first have to say, where am I? Where am I holding? So we have to be honest with ourselves. And the first thing is he had to know where are you holding? 
Father had to admit, I sinned. Yes, I know what I did. I know I'm not holding. I know I'm on this rung of the ladder and I want to climb up. You first have to know where you are and I want to climb up. I want to go in the right direction. And there's a very famous story. This is just a parable, but I'm going to use it to bring out this point that Hashem asks us, where are we holding? And he only wants from where I am holding. I first have to just be honest and say, it doesn't matter. I don't have to look at everyone else. I just have to look at me. Where am I holding? And then as long as I want to grow, I can move on. Hashem only wants what I have, where I'm holding right now. And if a few years ago, I would, maybe even I was doing better. God doesn't, he's saying, where are you holding now? And go from where you are now and give me and serve me from where you're holding right now. So there's, so this is the parable. The czar used to send around messengers to ask people how much they loved the czar and how much, that's how much confidence he had. He had to send out messages to everybody always asking, you know, do you care for me? How much would you give? So he sent out a messenger once to a man. And this man, you know, was a simple man. And he says, so the czar's messenger says to him, if you would have 10 fields full of beautiful crops, would you give it to the czar? And he said, yes, of course, if I would have that. You know, he was a simple man, he didn't have it. But if I would have it, of course I would. And then he said to him, what if you would have a room full of gold? Would you give that to the czar? Why? Most definitely I would. And then he asked him, if you would have a treasure chest full of diamonds and rubies and sapphires, would you give it to the king? Yes, most certainly. And what if you would have 20 vineyards full of the most luscious grapes? Would you give that to the czar? Indeed, certainly, yes, I would. And what if you would have 10 chickens? Would you give that to the czar? Absolutely not. And the messenger is sitting there so puzzled. And he says to him, you're going to give vineyards full of luscious grapes and you're going to give diamonds and rubies and gold and you're not going to get 10 chickens? Why not? Could anyone think why not? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and tell me why he would be willing to give rubies and diamonds and gold but not 10 chickens? Well, that's because he had the 10 chickens and he didn't have the other stuff. Exactly. If I were a rich man, I'd give lots of charity. God doesn't want, if I were a rich man, if I had millions of dollars, I'd give. God wants to know, if you have $10, would you give one away to charity? If you have 10 chickens, what you really have, oh, you have a good voice. Are you using that to serve a shadow? Oh, you're very organized and you know how to do that. Oh, you've got a great personality. Are you cheering someone else up? What you have, are you using that to serve Hashem? It doesn't only apply to money and objects, it also applies to talents and you know attributes that we have. Are we using this to serve Hashem? And so when he says, Ayeka, where are you holding? Where are you? You have 10 chickens, serve me with 10 chickens. I'm not expecting you to serve me with diamonds and rubies when you don't have that. It's a lot harder to serve Hashem with something simple that I own than something theoretical that I don't. Yes, Susan. It's, it's very hard to give somebody something if they're afraid to accept what it is that you have to give. In other words, I like to give my time because I don't have money to give. I like to give my time uh, towards some, maybe helping somebody uh, with a garden or maybe with uh, helping somebody accomplish something that I can help them with. And personally, I think that in many instances, that's more appreciated than money. 
time and giving of yourself is so extremely valuable. And that's what we're saying that it doesn't only apply right. to, you know, to money, but it applies it doesn't apply to, to physical. Right? It also applies to physical things. And Hashem doesn't just want our money. Yes, there is a mitzvah to give tzedakah, and that is one of the mitzvahs. But it also, that's what we're saying. If you have 10 chickens, if you are talented in something, or if you have time, just let's just take the example that you gave of time. Am I going to use all the time just indulging? Or am I going to use an hour like all of you ladies right here who deserve a big round of applause, give yourself a pat on the back, that you're spending an hour learning Tyra when you could be doing something else? Am I going to spend five minutes? Devorah, this is fascinating. What you're doing is fascinating. It's so interesting. Well, this is just the Tyra. I'm, I didn't make anything up. <laughs> I'm just I'm just taking other other things and giving it over, sharing it. But that's the idea. If you have, are you going to spend five minutes calling someone and cheering them up? Are you going to share something you learned from this Torah class and enlighten someone else? It could be a minute. It could be two. People think, oh, if it's not going to be grand and glorious. No, Hashem says, where are you holding? Exactly where you're holding with what you got. Share it. If you know Aleph and Bays, and the other person only, only knows Aleph, teach them Bays. Share, whether it's Tyra, whether it's your time, whether whatever it is, you know, am I giving to Hashem what he wants from where I'm holding right now? Yes, Natalie. It's interesting because um, Adam blames um, his wife. Good. That's it, the next question we need to have that I was waiting for someone to ask. Thank you, Natalie, for asking all the questions I wanted blame. to be asked. And she blames the serpent. Excellent. So it's not their fault that they've sinned because there was an outside force that caused it. And this is what Hashem is trying to get from them. Right, right. So let's let's discuss that. Um, so yes, it's true that you know, and and Chavar responds that that she was tempted by by the snake, but you know, so he's going to be punished for what he did, which we'll discuss um, hopefully now. Um, but you're still responsible for your actions, and when you have the choice between good and bad, even if someone convinces you, yes, they were 100 percent wrong. Um, but Hashem sent that as a test for you. And a test, we discussed this last time, the test is only when there's two good things. If someone offers me a million dollars or a penny, it's not free choice that I chose the million dollars. Okay, because obviously free choice is, you know, am I going to sit and study, learn Torah for an hour? Or am I going to watch that movie? Because that movie is really exciting and I want to see it and I'm curious to know what's happening, you know? That's free choice because when something is, but when something is, you know, outright blatantly better than the other thing, that that's not free choice. So yes, the snake is going to be punished. So we're going to discuss that right now. But what she did that, you know, she is still responsible. It's a very hard challenge of good choice. And she had, that's what we discussed last time. We were saying what good intentions she had. She really did have very good intentions, but and that's where the clothing comes in. Hey, we need to protect ourselves. And that's where she says, I need help for my husband. I can't do this on my own. And yes, we figure it out. And we know how to serve Hashem with our good and bad. But it's a constant challenge of, you know, I got to protect myself and put myself in the right situations with my clothing, with the right people, with all these things, the right community, the right circumstances, so that I can constantly choose what's good. So let's go into what, what you're discussing now about, um, you know, first discussing, what, how does Hashem open the conversation? He says, who told you that you're unclothed? Why does Hashem say who told you? No one needs to tell you you're naked. But that's what Hashem was saying. Where do you know it's shameful to be naked? How did you get here? So again, he's making them think. Ayeka, in Pasuk Tess, where are you? Where are you holding? And then he's reminding him again, oh, you're about to do Teshuvah, you're about to repent? How did you get here? I sinned, is the answer. He's got to think to himself, right, I sinned. 
he's got to, he's prompting him to do teshuva. And he, the first step, as we spoke before, we're seeing this come up a few times because it's so important that you first need to be humble. You first need to say, you know what? I made a mistake. And sometimes it takes us a long time to do that, but I've tried it. It works. It works like, like magic. You know, when you just say, I'm sorry, I did something wrong and you have no problem saying that, so much easier. You're ready to move on and change. You know, you tell your husband, I'm so sorry I did this. You can admit it. You know, most men are egotistical. They can't, but I'm very lucky. My husband taught me this. It's no big deal just to say, they'll just say like, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Like, boom, you feel better. In two minutes, it's done. You know, like, that's it. So, so that's the idea that you first need to just admit, and you can't be living in your ego. You have to feel a little humble. I know I did something wrong, and then you can move on to the next. So, then we're in 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 pasuk your days in in number twelve, uh, verse twelve. That's what Adam responds though. You know, he responds as Natalie, you know, just brought in. I'll, I'll pull it up on the screen again for a minute so everyone can see. Now, what does he respond? The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave it to me, so I ate. In other words, it's the woman. that that That's why I did it. Chava. So why doesn't he just say the woman? Why does he say, Asher Nasati, Madi, that you gave to be with me? Because Adam is blaming on the fact that Hashem, you put me here. Like you gave me this wife. Like I didn't just go do something wrong and find someone. You gave me this wife who was good for me. And so I trusted, you know, that what you gave to me. But it is human nature to blame. And again, Tyra is from Hira'a. Hira'a means lesson, to teach. Torah means to teach. And the Torah is always here to teach us something. And it is telling us that, yes, this is human nature. The first human person played the blame game. That's our nature. That's what we do. But, you know, we got to learn from this. So he, he is saying like, oh, let me blame it on Chava. That's our nature, but it's not, not really what we're supposed to be doing. And there's a famous story of Rebbe Lazar ben Yerdai, who was a terrible sinner. And he sinned so, so much. And so, so he was, did every sin in the book. And he was really like far away from what a good Jewish man should be. What's the name again? El Lazar ben Yerdai. And what happened was he was one time sinning with, a woman, and the woman said to him, you know, you've come so low. And that gave him wake up call. And he was like, I'm not, what, where am I? What have I been doing? This is crazy. And he so, so badly wanted to repent and come back, you know, to the right place. And he started to pray. And he said, he really like felt, okay, enough. I don't want to be this person anymore. I want to be a good person. And what did he do? He said, he went to the mountains and he said, mountains, please, I beg of you, pray on my behalf. I, you know, I'm a sinner. Uh, please pray on my behalf. And the mountain said, no, I'm sorry. We were, we're busy taking care of ourselves. We can't pray for you. And then he went to the heavens and he said, you know, please pray for me. And they said, no, we can't. And so he went on, you know, and everyone said, no, we can't pray for you. So finally he says, Ein hadaver elabi. the thing is only dependent on me. I can't go to anyone else. I'm the one who sinned. I can't, I need to do it myself. So he cried from the depths, the depths of his heart and he felt Hashem and he said, Hashem, Hashem. And he really meant it. And then Hashem took away his soul. He said, you did such a high level of teshuva. He was repented and he left this world. And what does this symbolize? 
When he went to the mountains, the word for mountains is har. What is the word for parent? Harim is mountains. And how do you say parents in Hebrew? Horim. It's the same word, just above one little word in there. So it's the same root word. What do we do when we sin? We blame our parents. We say, well, our parents, my parents, you know, they spoiled me too much. That's why I feel so entitled. They were so negligent. They didn't take care of me. That's why I'm like the way I am. I have so much, you know, uh, and we go on and on. You know, we blame, we blame our parents. Too much like this, too much like that. Or we blame our society and we say, you know, it's not my fault. It's because I grew up in this community or I went to this school and all the people around me. Or we start blaming my mazel, which means my, my fortune, my luck. It's just the way I was created. You know, so we say like he went up to, he asked the heavens, you know, the stars and the constellations. It's not me. It's just, this is like my nature. People say like, you know, and especially nowadays when we're living in the I world, you know, where everyone is, but this is what makes me feel good. And this is how I was just born this way. There's nothing I could do. Yes, there is something you could do. If you're born a thief, train yourself not to be a thief. What do you mean? If you're born with a temper, work on it. Practice. Like we said last time, just practice one time, two times, three times responding. You know, you can't do it all the time, but start. And you know what? The little turtle got there first by taking those little baby steps, we can do it. So that's what we learn. We're not blaming it on somebody else. We're not blaming it on somebody else. We are looking, and Elezer ben Yerdai taught us, I can't blame it on my parents. I can't blame it on my surroundings. I can't blame it on my mazel. This is just the way I was born. No, I need to look inside myself and then I will be helped. And there's another story. It was a famous um, rabbi. He was a disciple of the Bavacher, the, uh, the one of the Bavacher Rebbeim rabbis. And he, his name was Ramendel Furterfas, and of the, the previous Bavacher Rebbe. And of, um, anyways, and he, he was also imprisoned for spreading Judaism, you know, not for not for anything, uh, no, no crime, just, you know, living in communists and not being able to observe, you know, Yiddishkeit properly. And he was put in prison and he would learn from everything in prison. There's so many stories about him. And one of the stories is that he was in the prison with um, a bunch of other people in his room. And, in it, and the officer would always come into his room and they would play cards. And the officer would tell them you know, you, you can't play cards. And he would come in and there were no cards to be seen. So they'd be playing cards. They weren't allowed to play cards in the prison. The officer would walk in, there's no cards. The officer would leave. The second he left, the cards were out there playing cards. So after this happens a bunch of times, Ramendel Fertifas, this young man says to the other men, he says, can I ask you a question? How do you do this? What do you do? The officer comes in. There are no cards. The officer leaves. There's cards. A second before, the second after. How do you pull this off? So the man says, okay, we see you're a good guy. You're not going to tattle on us. You're a really honest man. We're going to tell you. He says, I am a pickpocket. That's why I'm in prison. That's my profession. So as soon as the man comes in, the officer, I take the cards. I slip it in his pocket. He checks everywhere everywhere except his own pockets. And then as soon as he's about to leave, I'm a pickpocket, so I just slip it right out of his pocket. And he never, ever looks in his own pocket. He checks it up and down, but he will never look in his own pocket. So what's the lesson? A lot of times we go blaming. We're looking here, we're looking there. Oh, it smells. How come everywhere I go, it smells? Maybe it's me. So... We need to look in our own pockets. So Ramendel Fertifa said, wow, this is such a great lesson. And he came out in prison and he would, you know, he would speak and he would talk and encourage and 
he said, what did I learn from this? I always have to look in my own pockets. I always have to look in the mirror and look at myself and not try to blame others.